Hi everyone, it's Diana. And I'm Nick. And we are Team RCIA. It's all things RCIA with Team RCIA. And it is, what, two, three days before Christmas? Uh, it's pandemic, There's so who knows? No, time has no meaning. <laughs> but, but, yes. Well, <laughs> well, kind of along that theme about time having no meaning, what we're coming up, we're, we're in Advent, we're coming up on the Christmas season, and it's uh, for, for our catechumens, one of the richest times of the year for us to kind of catechize and talk about our faith, and, and a lot of the symbols and the teachings are, are so clear and so uh, ingrained, not just in our church lives, but in society's life as well. It becomes usually a pretty easy thing to catechize around this time of season, but now because of pandemic and we have to be uh, communicating via media like this and we can't really get together and experience Christmas the way we usually do, it's a real challenge. How do we, how do we continue to shape and form our seekers uh, when, when we don't have access to a lot of the usual Christmas activity that we do yeah. basically we can't get together yeah we can't party we can't pray together we can't do all yeah. the stuff yeah, that really, we usually do it's really tough this time of year and that sucks and then um so what we wanted to do today is to talk about <clears throat> some of the ways we can incorporate uh, some of the christmas symbols and some of the ways we think about christmas into the ways that we are able to communicate through this kind of video media or stuff we would email to our seekers, just ways we can begin to have conversations with them or to help them have conversations in their homes, in, uh, you know, to do what we can during this season. And, and right up at the top of that, this is, this is an important principle to keep in mind, whether we're in pandemic or not. There's, uh, I grew up in the Midwest, United States, in a sort of a German-American family, but you know, my family had been here for generations, so there wasn't a lot of German-ness in our, in our household. Okay. Well, uh, except when it came to Christmas, because we did a lot of the stuff that comes from uh, Northern Europe and specifically Germany around Christmas, and those are things like Christmas trees and Advent wreaths and stuff like that. So when I moved to California, I got involved in a parish uh, that was primarily uh, Mexican and Mexican-American. And I went to a meeting, I was, I don't know, it was my first month of being in the parish and it, it was coming up on Advent and, and they were gonna have a liturgy planning meeting around Advent and I showed up and a bunch of other people showed up and I was the only one who spoke English. Everybody else spoke Spanish, only Spanish. And, and I had no Spanish at that point. And I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do. And thankfully, after a little bit of time, another person showed up who was bilingual. And, and so we started to talk about planning Advent. And I had all kinds of ideas about what we could do with an Advent wreath. And we had a very high ceiling. I was gonna make, we like imagined a giant Advent wreath with big candles. And I'm talking all about the Advent wreath. And the, the other folks in the room were just kind of staring back at me, and I thought it was because of the language barrier, but it wasn't. The, the, the translator was doing a good job. It was just that uh, folks who grew up in Mexico, or at least uh, folks of that generation who grew up in Mexico, didn't have a lot of experience with Advent wreaths. It wasn't part of their culture. It wasn't part of their, their Christmas imagery. And, and it took me a while to figure that out. Once I got that, then I said, well, what, what did you do growing up? What, how did you mark the season? And then they started talking about nacimientos, which I didn't know anything about at the time, but their eyes lit up and they were speaking very fast in Spanish. The translator was having trouble keeping up, but I was getting it, that, that this was something that mattered to them. And, and so the point I wanna make is, with all of these Christmas symbols or, or Christmas imagery that we're gonna talk about, it has, to, it has to start with the experience of the person in front of us. It can't start with our experience. It can't start with my German-American advent wreath as the, as the place of beginning, unless the person I'm talking to has that same experience. So, so that's the first thing we have to understand about this, the, that the experience of the seeker is the starting point for our formation. And that's true for any kind of catechesis, yes, right? Yes, yes. And, and that way of catechizing puts mm -hmm. uh, the Holy Spirit front and center as the teacher because it's the Holy Spirit, not your agenda, not your lesson plan, that directs the conversation. 
And so the Holy Spirit breaks into a person's life in many different ways. And then our job as catechists is to help give language to what that person has experienced and then to connect that to the teaching of the church, to the tradition of our faith, to the deeper meaning. And all of that is to say what we're going to do is mystagogy. And uh, these are my favorite kinds of uh, uh, videos because we just, we don't have a script. Yeah. We don't have any, blo uh, any blog post to go with this. So this is exclusive video blog posting here. Um, and we're just going to talk about some of the Christmas images and symbols and things that we grew up with and see what is deeper inside of those. Now, I don't think in your family you grew up with nacimientos exactly, but but in the Cal in California, nacimientos are much more common. Than well, first were. off, would you do you want to ex uh, describe well, what a nacimiento is? Well, you, again, you probably have more lived experience than I do, but uh, but <laughs> well, a, a we nacimiento. Went to, we went to Panama. Yeah, we went to Panama and you saw a nacimiento. Yeah, well, I've seen dozens since I moved to California, but the nacimiento, for those of you who don't know, is basically a, a it's a giant crash scenes. So so I grew up with just the, you know, Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus and a couple of animals and the three kings, you know. So so imagine just expanding that to cover a whole room. You know, where you're telling the whole life story of Jesus with these little figures and decorations and and uh, and so there are some places uh, so especially in big churches uh, in Latin America and some places in the United States where there these giant Nacimiento scenes get created, but in uh, in Mexican and Mexican American homes in the domestic church, they often create Nacimiento kind of altars, Nacimiento corners or a tabletop where they'll create a whole Christmas scene, not Christmas scene, but the, a life of Jesus scene that uh, that has the the birth of Jesus as the beginning of the story. And then you sort of walk around, you know, like imagine it's on top of your dining room table and you, and you can sort of follow along the life of Jesus with these little action figures, yes. you know, throughout the... And so imagine uh, in my, my growing up, the kinds of scenes that I saw were looked a lot more like if you imagine those... Um, what is it, those train sets where yeah. people create these really elaborate, tiny miniatures, mm -hmm. but huge landscapes that have all of these little mini scenes uh, with, within it. And it's all just everyday, ordinary kinds of things. And so the nacimientos nacio, nacio, that I've seen are not, are not like these Christmas nativity scenes. They're more like miniatures but on a huge scale. And the thing that I recognized when we went to Panama um, several years ago, we saw that it filled up the entire room. And there were uh, images of uh, the life of Jesus, but also images from daily life. So there was the farmer over here. There was the, the uh, cook who was making bread over here. There was uh, uh, some kids playing with their dogs over here. It was modern day kinds of images, things that you would see happening in your own home. And and embedded, embedded within all of these uh, everyday contemporary scenes was scenes from the life of Christ. Christ's birth, the Annunciation, the angels, the shepherds, the, the cross, the trial. You know, all of these were embedded among our ordinary daily lives. And that catechizes, that says something very significant that goes beyond just Christmas and, you know, gifts and the birth of Jesus. It's saying God dwells with us right now. And that's the basic message of Christmas. Not that God dwelled among us years and years and years ago. God dwells with us now. And in these nacimientos, for people who may um, f feel like they've been forgotten, they are on the outskirts of society, that message is so crucial to their living as people of faith, as people with hope. 
And that really just shifts our uh, vision of what we're seeing when we see a nativity scene or a nacimiento or something where our life is embedded with God's life. So one thing you could do during the pandemic is you could you could ask around if there are any parishioners in your community who have nacimientos already constructed in their homes and ask them to take pictures and share them with your uh, catechumens and candidates. And, and if you cannot find anyone in your parish who has nacimiento, then just Google. You know, there's, there'll be images online where you can find them and you can, um, you can share those and, and maybe have some prayer or conversation mm -hmm around some of the some of the pictures that you find online i think it would be so cool uh even to just take our traditional christmas nativity sets and include our own yeah. everyday images of our own life into that nativity scene yeah or you yeah. could you could you know build little figures out of you know if there are people that are time. crafty you know some some of your parishioners are really good at crafts you know and they can <laughs> they can sort of create little scenes they don't have to be super elaborate just you know if you if you say like what are ask your ask your seekers and candidates what what are three or four or five of your favorite gospel stories and then you know include the birth of christ story and include two three four of those favorite gospel stories and try to construct something on a countertop or a, a side table in your home and see if you can build an asiamento Mm -hmm. So send us your pictures. Of yeah. That. <laughs> um, did you want to talk about these or what yeah. do you want to do? Sure. Okay. So so looking at the starting with that sense of we start with the things that we're familiar with and then go from there uh, and dig deeper into what the big meaning is. Christmas is so filled with those kinds of ordinary everyday symbols that uh, you don't even have to be a person of faith. You know, you encounter these at, during this time of year. But for people of faith, we are called to look at these symbols and go deeper beyond just what uh, um, ordinary everyday society sees them as. And so, so we came up with some uh, typical symbols and we're just gonna kind of dig into them and see what uh, comes out that is bigger in its meaning. So I already mentioned the Christmas tree, which comes, which is sort of a European tradition, but it's become somewhat international now. And even non-Christians put Christian, uh, put Christmas trees up uh, in their homes. And they don't, they're doing it because of, uh, you know, the Christmas tree has taken a lot of, on a lot of secular meaning about Christmas. But for us, it still also has a spiritual meaning. And, and obviously when we think about a tree in, a, in Christian thinking, um, for me, my mind immediately goes to the cross. So we see that we see the decorated, beautiful Christmas trees, but we think about, but you know what, what what that tree would become eventually mm -hmm. for Jesus. I mean, Jesus was crucified basically on a tree, on a, on on wood that was taken from a tree, and so that the beauty of that tree is turned into a, a, an instrument of of torture and pain and sacrifice, and yet. Because the, the decoration hanging on the tree, the, the body of Christ uh, nailed to the tree, transforms it yet again into something beautiful. John, John's gospel tells us about the beauty of the cross, even in the midst of all the pain and death and destruction. And so uh, one of our Christmas carols, O Come All Ye Faithful, you know, the refrain is, O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord we can we hear that uh repetition of adoration again on good friday when we present the cross and we say behold the cross of christ on which hung the savior of the world come let us adore there are so many connections between christmas and the and the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that's starting to make a connection for us. What There's something bigger about Christmas than just the birth of a baby in a manger. It, this is saying to us, there was a purpose for this birth. The, uh, there was a purpose in this becoming human. And, and so we can keep going deeper into that. 
So just this, uh, just last night, just last Diane and night. I were looking at the, uh, at the, the convergence, con conjunction, conjunction, conjunction yes. of uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And so to, if, uh, if you didn't know those were yeah. planets, like if you imagine, <laughs> if you imagine the shepherds or the wise men yes. back in, back in the day, they wouldn't have thought of those as planets. And, and Jupiter, sky. Jupiter and Saturn were so close together when we were just looking up at the sky, it looked like one big giant bright star and then we had a pair of binoculars and we could look at it we could see that they were you could see two separate images when we looked through the binoculars but for the for the shepherds if there was a if there was an astronomical event like that it would have looked like this this bright shining light kind of breaking apart the darkness and that's the imagery that Luke uses in his gospel when he talks about the star you know, and when he talks about the shepherds and when he talks about the, the wise men, they're following, uh, we're following this light mm -hmm. in the darkness. I love it. And then that, that connects so beautifully to Easter Vigil. You know, we start Easter Vigil with the, the Liturgy of Light where we light the Paschal fire. And it is this fire that dispels the darkness and no uh, darkness can overcome it. And then we light the Paschal candle and then we follow the candle into the church and we're singing the, the great uh, um, exultant to the Thanksgiving song of praise for Christ to the light. And then we hear the, the scripture of uh, the Israelites uh, going through the Red Sea and before the Red Sea, they're camped out by the sea trying to figure out what are we going to do. and in the darkness is this pillar of fire that leads them through the night into salvation. And so all of these signs that we're seeing right now at Christmas time is they're already pointing us to the Paschal mystery, the Paschal event of uh, our complete freedom from death. Another another symbol that happens around this time is bells, mm. which I'm not hearing because of the pandemic. But uh, <laughs> you know, but if you go anytime you go shopping or just walking around a, a, any kind of city, there, there'll be there'll be the Salvation Army bell mm -hmm. ringers, and there'll be Christmas carolers with bells. And just in most department stores or most public places, they'll have bells either recorded or actual bells ringing to kind of uh, note the season. A lot of parishes sometimes will, they'll 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 either train or they'll bring in a handbell choir during this time and, and ring those bells for parishes that have big bell towers. Sometimes they'll ring the bells on Christmas Day, and so that the ringing of the bells is is really a. Um, Kind of a big deal not it's not exactly liturgical but it is seasonal it's kind of has a spiritual meaning for the season oh but there are so many liturgical things about bells too it's the calling and the reminding of uh the call to prayer mm -hmm. you know and so in in most of our parishes i remember growing up uh, at those masses where we didn't sing we wouldn't sing, you know, those weekday masses or the 7 a.m. Sunday mass. The the altar server would pull the string on, at the side door of the sacristy, mm -hmm. and that would oh, yeah. ring this I whole set of that. bells. Yeah, Remember that? that too. You know, and that that you know, told everyone yeah. to stand up because yeah. it was mass was going to start. Yeah, like you wouldn't know with the priest walking in, but you know. But both you and I have had this great. Um, encounter with bells when we in, in separate decades went to St. John's yeah. Collegeville, St. John's University and Abbey in Minnesota. And, and Google that for yes. the image. because The bells, the bell banner. Bell banner. Just Google St. John's bell banner. And there's also, I know, videos and audio clips of the bells. There are five bells and each of them has a name. And think of this bell banner Oh God, you're gonna have to explain it because it's just amazing. Well, it's a it's a massive wall of concrete, giant, huge, uh, in front of the church. in front of the church. So it's and it's on huge legs, huge pillars. So the the and I don't know how high it is. It's it's, it's taller it's than like the church. half a football half, half of a football field what is up, that? up in the air, and then yards. yeah, fifty <laughs> yards, and then the and then the banner itself. I don't know. It looks like it's another fifty yards high, and then. And then there are these five 
slots near the top of it where the five bells are. And when it rings, you hear it all over the countryside. And so, so these five bells, and, and there's this whole ritual of blessing the bells, and, yep. and each bell has a name. I, I'm forgetting what they are, but I think there's the angels, names of the angels and all. But at the top of every hour, they ring, and at the uh, bottom of every hour, they ring. But they also ring about 10 minutes before the start of every um, morning prayer, noontime prayer, uh, mass, evening prayer, and night prayer. And uh, so when you hear those bells, you know, make your way over to the church uh, because it's time to pray. But then we also have, we also have uh, in, in the tolling of the bells whenever someone dies mm-hmm. and we're, we are uh, praying uh, the funeral ritual, the bells are tolling. At evening prayer on solemnities, this was this gave me chills the first time I experienced it. At evening prayer um, on very special days, at uh, the singing of the gospel canticle, we'd start singing the Te Deum, or I think it was the Te Deum or the Magnificat. I'm forgetting. And then I I would hear the bells going at the same time, and they weren't supposed to be going. But then I realized that that was intentional. The bells were singing with us as we were giving praise, uh, and I thought, "This is this is creation, all creation being called to give praise to God." It's a reminder that now is the day of salvation. Right now, not yesterday, not tomorrow, but now. When you hear those bells, bells now is when uh, you are being saved, and and that is a, a call to give praise, and so bells every time zuzu and the bells you know (laughs) every time a bell rings you can remember that you have been saved hey it's so good so and another really important symbol during this time is the giving of gifts and uh, that has really gotten very what commercial commercialized and and um I don't know, it's, it's difficult to talk about giving gifts and, and still make a spiritual connection to it. But I think of it like years ago, my mother told me to stop giving her Christmas gifts and birthday gifts and Mother's Day gifts. She had enough stuff. She didn't want any more gifts. And I promptly ignored her and, and gave her stuff anyway, because not because she needs more stuff, but because it is, it's an act of, of giving, of giving something of myself, mm-hmm. something, something of my heart. Uh, to another heart, to to someone else as a way of saying thank you, as a way of blessing, as a way of connection, as a way of expressing love. Mm-hmm. And that is really at the heart of our Eucharist. U- Eucharist is all about the giving of gifts and the receiving of gifts. Mm-hmm. And so in Christmas time, we think not just of the present that uh, we give to our beloved but also the kings the three kings the mm-hmm. three gifts of the magi but the and and we can go into each of those uh, the symbolism of each of those gifts the gold frankincense and myrrh but the thing about the gift is that it's all about sacrifice yeah. sacrifice uh, for the one who is giving the gift because you got you have to sacrifice something if it's not money it's time it's effort it's thinking so thoughtful gifts take energy because you have to think yeah, don't do gift cards do a thoughtful gift you know? well i i wouldn't reject you the like gift the gift card. cards okay. <laughs> so right. if you want to send so me now a i know what card. to get you for christmas <laughs> but but so the sacrifice of giving the gift uh has deep meaning and we we can immediately think of the the gift of uh of life that we receive in Christ, the gift that the Father gives to us through his Son who, uh, who came down from heaven that we might have life. And so that, that unwrapping of the gift, the unwrapping of the child, the swaddling clothes, you know, and the gift is, is you, if it's wrapped, you don't know what's in it. And so we can, we can imagine that Christ, we don't know what Christ looks like because maybe Christ is in disguise, wrapped up in the, the image of someone who is completely unlike you, you know, but inside is a great gift of life there. And so we can, we can think of these kinds of gifts as a reminder of the sacrifice, but also even for the receiver, the one who is receiving the gift, 
uh, who is it? Uh, Louis Marie Chauvet, a, a theologian, a liturgical theologian, talks about the that when we receive a gift, it's it's obligatory to say thank you, to mm -hmm. send a thank you card, some kind of you you send the giver something that acknowledges that you got the gift, you know. But with God, there's nothing that you can give back to God that would equal or pay back the gift that God has given us. And so Chauvet says, the way we give back our thanks to God is by giving the gift we have received to another who is in need. And so we're, we're, we're not paying back, we're paying forward the gift uh, that we have received in Christ. And so this, this way of um, understanding that the gifts we are given, we are called to sacrifice and give to others. And so give lots of gifts and then give them forward. You know. So the, the way you can extend this uh, for your seekers and candidates and catechumens uh, during pandemic is, is just to have a conversation like this. Uh, either, uh, you know, with, with some people in your own household that you, that you put online, just like we did, mm -hmm. to talk about some Christmas images that are important to you and how you connect those to your faith. Or you could do a dialogue, uh, you know, with a, in a room with uh, your seekers and have each of them pitch in their ideas about how they connect this with their faith. Um, you could send out a, a, a sheet, like a, an email with some ideas for them to think about. You could connect any of these images to uh, Christmas songs, uh, hymns, carols, to the prayers around Christmas, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. So be creative and think of ways that you can bring some of this Christmas imagery into dialogue with your seekers yeah yeah and, and th it really is just so fun you don't have to stress about any of this yeah. uh, again Christmas. none of this was planned or written out onto a piece of paper and we just kind of thought what what connections are, are happening here when we think of these these uh, images that are so ordinary for us in our mm -hmm. everyday lives uh, share with us some of your special images for Christmas and and what deeper things do you see in them when you reflect on them? Arlene and Tony shared one of theirs uh, that during Advent, they would take uh, the baby Jesus and kind of the, the baby Jesus would move from room to room in their home until finally it arrives at the, the nativity scene at Christmas time. And so we, I, we have friends in Australia who do that with the kings. They'll move oh, the yeah. kings from place to place throughout the season. We would do that all the time yeah. at, at work in the chancery. The, mm -hmm. Every day, the kings would be in a different place, slowly moving to the, the nativity scene. And so share with us your Christmas uh, traditions and, and if what you, you have, see. And if, if you are, you know, and if your parish is pre predominantly descended from Europeans, uh, it, but you have folks from other other regions, you know, uh, talk to them. Find out what their, what their traditions are because they're heck of fun, you know. Oh, heck of fun. You're so big. Uh, and that reminds me of a new tradition I, I discovered today, the Baby Yoda Mando Snowflake. Yeah, that would be brand new. I could, that's our star for this year. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay, friends. Well, thank you for joining us in this uh, fun romp through some Christmas symbols. Have and, a Merry Christmas. Yeah, yeah. And enjoy and stay safe. And we are praying for you and we ask that you pray for us. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.